think I, I think I stopped somewhere in these slides. So quick announcement, uh, you're going to have a quiz, your first quiz in week four during the lecture time. It includes whatever we cover in the introduction slides, these slides. And today we try to finish this introductory chapter. Next week we'll study something totally different. Oh, it's the basic of seismic techniques, and uh, that's seismology. Uh, so I believe I completed all these slides. Uh, I finished here. I'm somewhere in noises. I believe probably here. That's the slide I stopped. Am I right? So this is where I believe I stopped. Let's take some the attendance as well. So the last time I said that Whenever I try to do a geophysical survey or geophysical analysis, there are steps I have to follow. There are stages I go according. And those stages are well defined. First, we start the acquisition. Then we try to do data reduction. Then we do filtering. The next step, step is filtering. During the filtering stage, we try to remove the noise from the signal. Signal is the part we are interested in, or that's the one coming from the earth, whereas the noise could be also coming from the earth, but it's not something I'm interested in, and it contaminates the signal I want to record. It's a contamination to the signal I record. For example, here I have a seismic record. That's what we call a seismic signal, a trace in the figure there. It's very clean, very good, very nice. That's represent a reflection from the, or a refraction from some interface. And we know that geophysical techniques can only be deployed or used whenever there is a variation in the physical property. Whenever there is a change in the physical property. In the case of seismic, that physical property is basically the seismic waves, the waves. And the waves, seismic waves in rock depends on many parameters. One of them is how hard is the rock, the age of the rock, uh, per porosity percentage, and so many other things. Don't need to write, because we'll cover these things in more detail in the seismic section or seismic chapter. However, that's what I call a seismic reflection or seismic trace. It is created basically whenever I have a source, that I assume it's a source, and one sensor. So the source could be what? Could be a hammer, simple case, or sledge hammer, what we call a, a large hammer. This is something you will see during the field visits or field work we'll conduct together. We send the energy, the energy travels spherically in every direction. That's below the earth. If we take only one ray, it goes here. That's an interface or um, a boundary, boundary between two layers. It reflects back. So when it's traveling, it's some kind of a wave or a signal or a pulse. Travels like that. It goes with time deeper and deeper until there is a change in physical property. This change is, re is reflected as change in velocity for the seismic case. Velocity as well as density. So it reflects back, get recorded there. So initial time, those initial time, why there is no shaking? Why there is no disturbance? Because the energy haven't arrived yet. I start recording the time I hit the ground, they start recording the time I hit the ground, it definitely will take some time for the energy to go hit 
the interface are reflected back. The slides are available. I sent you these slides, I believe. Am I right? By email, they are also available in Moodle. Uh, my recommendation, if you get a chance to print them, print them before you come to the, I try to print them uh, for you from next week's onward. So it get reflected back the trace, I get a nice, clean signal. This is the signal. Whereas if someone probably walking nor nearby, if he's dancing or shaking or jumping on the ground, it, he or she will also generate waves. Those waves will get also be detected by the instrument provided that they are happening simultaneously. We consider this as a noise, that's the noise, the energy generated by the traffic or by the human, by anything else, by wind, by rain probably, these are all noises. I only need the source or the energy generated by the hammer. The hammer is the signal. So it goes down, get recorded. That's what we call a clean good. Whereas what we see here in this case, that's, these are very similar. One of them is noisy, the other is without noise. One of the simple ways of uh, removing noise, one of the simplest, easiest way of removing noise is repeating the measurements what we call uh, stacking, vertical stacking. And what exactly is the noise compa in comparison to the signal is determined actually by your objective. What are you looking for? So what is signal and what is noise is actually determined, what is your objective? For example, in seismic techniques, there is a method called MASWAM. Maswa. It's called Maswa. There is a technique called Maswa acquisition. In this technique, we are not interested probably in this type of energies, the energy with, which reflects back from an interface. We are probably interested on the energy created by car traffic, by human. So Maswa is another technique. In this technique, we try to measure the noises, what we consider as noise in seismic reflection. So what is noise and what is signal is actually determined on your interest, on your purpose, on your objectives. For example, this is a model, subsurface, subsurface model. Um, in the case, if you are interested on this granite, that's a granite intrusion within the layered rocks. These are the layered rocks. In case I'm interested on the granite, the small dikes, this is a gravity survey, by the way. So the granite have a lower density than the sedimentary rocks, for example. So it has this depression. Do you see the depression there? That depression is created because of what? Not dikes, granite. What dikes will produce? Dikes have a higher density, so their gravity value is larger. Dikes will produce these high frequency anomalies, high frequency signals, or what we call traces. So you see this one? These fluctuations are created by what? By the dikes. Dikes have a higher density than the granite itself. So they are, they could be considered, if I, I'm interested on the granite, granite those signals or a change in fluctuation in gravity value produced from the dike is the noise. Those are the noises, whereas the depression I want is, the, that's the interesting thing to me, that's the signal. However, if someone is not interested on the granite, he's interested on what? On the dikes. Then dikes are the signal. What is signal, what is noise, is the determinant on what is your objectives. Is that clear? 
Good? So here is again a seismic for the seismic case. The noise uh, is dependent on the type of measurements you are making. For example, seismology shakes, we are trying to shake the ground. We are trying to send an energy to deeper layers and get the reflection back. The reflection happens whenever there is a change in the rock property or physical property of the rocks. If there is no change, there's going to be no reflection. So for the seismic case, the noise could be what traffic, tides, an instrument can create its own noise, power line noise. At what frequency the power lines operate in Oman? Do you have any idea? At what? Who said 50? What's your name? Khaled, petroleum engineer. So 50, that's 50. In, in USA, what's the frequency they operate? 60, yes, 60, 60. So you will find these frequencies in your signals. And when, when I was doing my PhD, I struggled how to remove those frequencies. So 50 hertz frequency is a power noise, so it could be an instrument noise. Those type of noises, they are what we call random noises. They are random. Most often, they are random. Tides, traffic, rains, raindrop, for the case of seismic. Seismic, I'm sending a shaking to the ground. The shake propagates away from the center, from the point, I hit the ground. Anything also shaking the ground at the same time, that's considered as noise. For example, whenever they try to deploy seismic station, seismic station for recording earthquake. In Oman, we have 20, 20 seismic stations. They try to put them in very calm, quiet area. They try to select very good area that not, not noisy. The noise in that area is considered as homes, traffic, etc. However, if you are conducting resistivity survey, for example, any external power, electricity, that's considered as a noise. In that case, shaking does not have any effect. Traffic does not have any effect. If you are conducting, for example, electromagnetic survey, electromagnetic survey or magnetic survey, is it possible then to hold the phone while I'm carrying out the survey? No, you can't have a phone. Phones, they send also electromagnetic waves or receive electromagnetic waves. So you might be contaminating your recording, your signals, your data by holding a phone or carrying a, carrying a phone with you while making measurements, your physical measurements. The point here, every type has its own noise types. Every technique or geophysical technique has different noises. So is it necessary to know all of them right now, at this stage, no. We'll study each chapter in chapter in detail some, some type of geophysical technique. We'll start with seismic, move to graffiti, and so on. Graffiti somehow is also, um, can be affected by shaking. So if you put your graphimeter, small equipment, keep away from it some distance, and don't make shaking. Magnetic, for example, will be affected by any fences, any power lines, things like that. Is it clear? So this is, an, again, a snapshot of a trace without noise. This is noisy. These type of noise are easy to remove. This is easy to remove. One, of, one way, how I can recognize the noise here? Which one do you think has high frequency content? Which is shaking a lot? The upper or the, the lower. So a good geophysicist can recognize the noise in a such way. He knows that, oh, the frequency content is high in this second, in this trace, and uh, those type of noises can easily be removed. If you, do some, if you know some um, signal processing. So there is a course in signal processing. And that's, yes, do you have a question? Best? 
The, these are types of canceling the noise. And in, for example, if I go back here, uh, here you can do polynomial fitting. It's, um, don't need to know that. So if, if I'm interested on granite, I would like to remove the, those signals produced from the dikes. I can do polynomial fitting. A polynomial, 1D or 2D polynomial, or 2D in this case, not 1D would be, or 3D probably, would do a best fit. You fit the line, you fit the line following the, the, all the signal, and take it as the general trend. So if you are interested in the general trend, that's the general, the dotted line is the general trend. That's some way you can remove the noises. It's some, some way, we'll not talk about it right now, what are the, how, what are the techniques to remove the noises, but in each chapter, we'll discuss a little bit, not necessarily detailed, because there are other courses in geophysics. They go into depth how to tackle the noise, how to remove the noise. Let's move forward. As I said, one of the best technique to remove the noise, but it's very expensive too, is to what? Repeat the measurements. Do repeat. Record multiple times with the condition that you do not change the survey li layout. Survey configuration haven't been changed. Having the same survey configuration, repeat the measurement. For this simple configuration, source and receiver, and your source is hammer, how you can do repeat? Could someone volunteer? How I can repeat, how I can take multiple measurements? I simply hammer the ground, multiple times at the same time, at the same location. I keep hammering once, twice, three times, four times. And you will notice if you look that the traces generated while you are hitting the ground, you will notice that there is some improvement in your signal. And that's something you will notice or observe during the field acquisition. I asked somebody to keep hitting the ground, maybe five times, six times, or 10 times. Is it good to keep hitting forever? No. At some level, whatever you hit, how much, how much time you repeat, it does not have any improvement on the signal. So the, the maximum probably, for example, for hammer hit is five, 10, depending on the noise. There is, uh, the area is very noisy, you probably need to repeat a lot. For example, when I was doing seismic refraction for field geophysics course uh, some time back, and we carried out the survey in a place where there is ar the army is practicing what? Shooting. The army was pra practicing shooting nearby, and uh, the data were very highly contaminated with noise. In such places, it's good to make the number of repeats or number of stacking, vertical stacking, probably 10, 15, to increase the signal to noise ratio. If I talk about signal to noise ratio, signal over noise, I need this parameter or this ratio to be hi as high as possible. One way to make it high is to increase what? Or, or reduce noise. This parameter is very important. Sometimes they write, write it like that, signal noise ratio, S, R, S and R in geophysics. Signal to noise ratio. So we call such repeat vertical stacking. It's vertical stacking. Why we name it vertical stacking, not just a stacking, because in seismology there is another, a different type of stacking. So this is only vertical stacking. Uh, if I try to differentiate the noises in geophysics, they could be categorized into two different groups. One of them is what? Random noise. One of them is random. The other one is coherent noise. The two different groups of noises. Random noise is a noise that is easy to deal with, easy to remove usually. Uh, if I ask you, is traffic a random or a coherent noise? It's a random, yeah. Traffic is a random. 
Whenever I say random, that's dependent on time. It's a dependent on time. Sometimes it's happening, the other time it's not happening. That's a random noise. Someone is walking while I'm taking measurements. That's also a random noise. Winds, are they random or not? It's a random as well. So those are random noises. However, if I go some slides back here, these slides, some kind of, this is in seismic technique, for example, we have noises. Other techniques, they have their own random and coherent noises. But for simplicity, just take this example. We see different types of waves. There are different types of waves impinging the ground. We have the source. The source is the vibrator shaking the ground. And there is a recording system which uh, connects to some sensors lie to the ground. We see different types of waves. One of them is called primary. The other one is multiple reflections. Love wave, Riley wave, air wave. For exploration geophysics, if you are interested in all exploration, for example, usually only the primary is the thing you are interested in. The primary is the thing you try to observe, keep apart from the remaining. And what's multiple? What do you think is a multiple reflection? You see this energy. This energy, it goes, hits the ground, some interface, go back. What happens here? It reflects down. It's not a primary. So this, for example, that's my source and receiver. Is this a primary or not? That's a primary. That's a multiple. This is a multiple. So with, if I record this one, which signal you think if this trace is recording, it goes, the energy, this trace goes, so that this pulse goes down, it takes some time, instead that nothing have came to the sensor. After some time, this is in time domain, time, this, the pulse reaches to the signal. So I get, a reflection, I get a change in the trace. The multiple can easily, for example, recognize in this case, it has how much time, if this time is one second, how much this time could be? This is two seconds. This is two seconds. But multiple is not as easy as this way. There are different types of multiples. And removing these multiples cannot be done by repeating measurements. Can I repeat? If you repeat, if you keep repeating, because the multiple is always there. It will happen all the time. It's a parameter or inherent thing in the ears itself. It's not from outside. That's what we consider as a coherent noise, a multiple. So some geologists might think, wow, this is one reflector. This is another reflector. There is another layer which is not true, that's a multiple. Maybe once, if you, don't do remo if you don't do processing, good processing, if you don't remove this multiple, the geologists will think that there are how many interfaces? Two different interfaces. However, in reality, there is only one interface. The other one is a multiple. Yes? How to differentiate between them? There are techniques, many techniques. So one of the techniques we'll study is deconvolution. Simplest technique is deconvolution. We'll study that in detail later on. Not in detail. I'm teaching the other course, data processing, because this is a bit advanced, how to remove it. You need to know some math. You need to also to finish another course, JUP 4001. Apply geophysics to appreciate in more detail what are different types of multiples and how each multiple can be removed. Deconvolution is one of the simplest techniques. For example, in this, chapter, in this course, at least I tell you, deconvolution can remove multiple. But how exactly? That's not our subject. 
Otherwise, we will stay just in one chapter. Seismology, seismology will not, cannot cover then graffiti and other chapters. So multiple is a noise, is a coherent noise. These type of waves, these type of energies, refraction, love, Riley wave, they are also considered as what? As coherent noises. They are noises. Air wave is a noise. I remember I was doing training in Schlumberger in Abu Dhabi. So what they were doing, they were boring the sensors beneath the sand. When they plant the Jufun, Jufun is a sensor which records seismic waves. So they plant it and they cover it with sand. What's the reason? To remove what noise you think? Air. Yeah, to eliminate, eliminate slightly the air noise. There is an air noise. So that's the reason we were trying to remove or bore the sensors while doing the acquisition. And believe me, the best stage to enhance this feature or this ratio, the best stage, according all, based on all these uh, stages of seismic acquisition or seismic analysis, we have, we start with seismic acquisition, uh, data reduction, and so on. The best stage you think is what? Which is the best stage to remove, to enhance this ratio? Enhance it. Huh? Huh? Nah? It's data acquisition. If you, if you acquire the rubbish, if you acquire rubbish, whatever processing you apply to it, it is still rubbish. So processing, filtering is a way to try to enhance something, beautify something. However, if you haven't acquired your data in a proper way, you cannot do anything. Data. It's better to reacquire the data. If you spent one million, go spend another two million. So the most expensive thing is usually data acquisition. Data acquisition is very expensive. And also, you need to be very cautious in this stage, data acquisition. So if I'm uh, using seismic technique, I need to be cautious that there is nobody moving. I need to ask students, please don't move. I remember last semester I talked to the students in a field acquisition inside SKU, in the garden between Block F and a College of Science. There is a, there is a garden, small garden. You know that. And I, there were so many students, and everyone was moving. And even there is a passage. So students, they keep moving in the passage. I couldn't use the data. I couldn't give the data back to the students to process it, to work on the data. The, the plan or the objective was to determine how many layers are there in that specific location. So instead, I went and found some other data I recorded with other courses, field geophysics course, and gave that data instead to the student. And my plan in here was to give the same data students themselves acquired and let them work, in, work on it on the lab, during lab session. So. Uh, it's very important that you be very cautious, ask students, for example, ask uh, your colleagues, uh, don't move shaking, don't move, be calm, especially the time someone is hitting the ground with a hammer. So as I said, the best stage, and that was actually a question in some of the quizzes, many students didn't answer it well, very well. Yeah, the best stage to enhance this ratio is during acquisition. So signal to noise, uh, if we keep talking about stacking, stacking is simple process. We sum all the recording together and take their best. Shall we take the best? What we take, what we do, how we sum them? We take what? The average, the mean. So what happens if I sum these traces? These are repetition, I record from one channel. We could have many traces, oh, sorry, many sensors. Channel uh, or sensors, there is, uh, these are synonymous. They, they imply the same meaning. These are sensors or channels. So I have three 
different sensors, three different traces or records. So if I go specific, this is time domain, that's the time. So here I have a peak, whereas here I have a trough deflecting to the right, deflection to the left. If I sum them together, what, in what way they will be combined? Destructively, indestructively. Trough with peak. They will be destructive way. Whereas there is a peak, 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 as well a peak, a deflection to the right, followed by deflection to the left. If I sum this part, that's the signal, what happens to them? Destructively, they will be added, sorry, constructively. They will be added constructively because that's the signal. Stacking vertical somehow can also help to remove coherent. Somehow, not necessarily always. But it's very good, Stack, vertical stacking is very one of the best options to remove what kind of noise? Incoherent. What's incoherent noise? It's the random noise. Incoherent means random, the opposite of coherent noises. Is that clear? However, there are situations, seismic or geophysical techniques in general, they are not deployable. They cannot be carried out. In what situation? In situations where the signal level is below the noise level. That's the signal. If the noise itself is so high, it's better not to conduct geophysical survey. Geophysical survey is useless in such situations. Whenever the noise is higher, noise is saturating all signal. Someone might ask, how I can tell? How can I can know that there is a high noise? One of the best technique to know is, for example, in seismic, in seismic, what's my source here is a hammer. What I can do to tell if there is a noise or no? What, what I can tell? If, huh, record? Huh? Yes, you record before hitting, you record calm. So if you record and there is nothing, nothing shaking the ground, what's your name? Khalil. Khalil, uh, Khalil are smart. <laughs> so it's gonna, you get a straight line. You get a straight line if there is no noise. However, you will, if you record without shaking, without hitting the ground, you will notice that there are some, some noises, random noises. If these random noises are so high, so big, don't record. Try to find another, another technique probably, not seismic technique, or do something else. Seismic is not deployable in such a case, seismic technique. Uh, for example, um, if you know that there is a power line, there is high power line, and you are trying to do some technique called VLF, no, you can't do VLF in that specific location. What's VLF, you don't need to know, but uh, this is just an example. You can't do VLF whenever there is a power cables or power lines, electricity lines. The same is true for magnetic. For example, for in magnetic technique, there are some days, we call them magnetic storms. The change in the magnetic, if magnetic field is so abrupt, very abrupt. The, the people who do magnetic uh, or, or interested in the magnetic field of the uh, Earth, they can't tell that. And this, during these days, whole the Earth will be affected, not specific location. Whole the Earth. The effect is from the sun. Sun might send some type of energy, will distort the magnetic field of the Earth for a couple of days, one or two days. The change in magnetic field will be so erratic, so abrupt, you can't deduce small change in magnetic value because of subsurface, change in the subsurface rocks. So in such days, can I do magnetic survey? No, no. The variation in the, in the noise is so big that whatever 
you record tiny change from the rocks, tiny change in the magnetic field from the rock beneath your feet are totally saturated, are totally hidden below the noise. So don't record in such cases. So this is a, a case where we can't do one of the ways, as I said, to, re, to know that uh, what is the noise level, just record without hitting. Record without hitting. So I remember in my PhD, in my PhD, I got data from PDU. The data were from PDU, and uh, there is another operator, a company, another contractor company was uh, doing the survey for PDU, geophysical survey. And before I start anything, I try to uh, appreciate the noise level. The recording, data recording before uh, anything, before they expect anything, any energy coming, controlled energy. So uh, that's one stage. That's how we process the data. We filter the data, we remove the noise, we enhance the signal level. Noise cannot totally be eliminated. We cannot eliminate it totally. And uh, uh, that's the reason, the, if you go back to the slides, mm, yeah, let me see, you'll find that there is a stage or one, uh, we call it, so slow, data processing. Why data processing? Because co coherent noise usually cannot be dealt easily. We do data processing. In Oman, for example, the company which conducts uh, seismic data processing, seismic data processing is called CGG. And they employ, you think whom most often? Whom they employ from SKU? Physicists. They employ physicists. Not, yeah, they employ some geophysicists, but they prefer physicists. Why? Because the, the word geo, is how many geo, three letters. Physics, that's the best answer I can give you. Which one is the biggest one? Physics, so geo is small. Physics is the large one, largest part. That's one of the reasons. Another reason, they were here before, yani, before having a specialization called geophysics. Geophysics is a bit new specialization or a major in our department or in the university. Before that, they were employing physicists, and they had a good feedback or good uh, impression about their performance in the company, the physicists themselves. They can teach them the basic processing, other things. The most important is you have some good background or foundation on the physical phenomenon, physical equations. By the end, we are saying geophysics is just the application of physical techniques to the study of the Earth or to the study of geology. So let's move. We assume that we did perfect job in processing. We cannot do much better. The data are yet not in a good form for geologists to interpret. Geophysicists, they struggle a lot. It's hard to satisfy a geologist. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to bring satisfaction to a geologist. So uh, we assume that things are ready, are clean, there is no noise. However, the data after this stage, processing stage, are not in a shape or a form which are interpretable by geologists. I cannot tell a, geophys oh, sorry, a geologist that, oh, after some time, I get a reflection. He says, what's the time? Hey, the velocity is that much. Now, he wants, what is the rock type? How deep is the rock? How many layers are there? That's the thing he is interested or she is interested in. Rather than, oh, it takes five seconds for the energy to go deep and returns back. What's that then? What's the meaning behind that? He says, what, what this convey to me? <laughs> I need a geological meaning. Still at that stage before modeling, things are in geophysical, in physical properties. Time speed, etc. Density, no, he wants rock. He says, what is the rock? And what are their, their thicknesses? How deep they are? How many layers are there? 
So this thing, converting the data from physical form to ge geological form is done where? In modeling. Modeling. So modeling in the, the public language or in a daily language is something, a simplification of the, re of the reality. What we say in model is a model in Arabic. What's the model in Arabic? Namudaj, am I right? So what, when I say model, it means it's not the reality. It's a simplification. Or is it possible in reality to model the earth perfectly, purely? Never ever. It's all hard. And what do you think, the geologists, in terms of geological data, what data could be the most or highly, what I can say, uh, resolution, have the highest resolution. What data geologists deal with, usually they are of highest resolution. Huh? Isopack, not very, no? In general, in all the courses you take in your academic life. Huh? No, highly resolved, or, or highest resolution. Are the data you sample or see beneath Microscope, yes. The microscope, microscope can tell you what are the composition, how many minerals, what is the percentage of uh, calcite, other minerals. Seismic, never ever can tell. Seismic or geophysical techniques, they can't tell what is the percentage of specific mineral. So they have microscopic analysis have the highest resolution, but they struggle from another, another thing. You can sample very, if this is my whole earth, let's say it's from here to here, let's say this is 10 kilometer, 10 kilometer. Can I break all this rock and bring it beneath the microscope? Oh. It's a, uh, it's not a lifetime, it's, it takes centuries and centuries, millions of years to sample all these rocks. 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer and by 10 kilometer. Whereas geophysical techniques gives you an idea what are the layers and what, are their, what is their thicknesses. This is, this is a model of the subsurface. That's a model, it's not the reality. It's not very close to the reality at all. Maybe the same data, if they were given to do two different people, two different geologists, they came up or come up with different interpretation, different models. Slight variation in your interpretation brings you different models. So as I said, uh, Microscopic data, they have the highest resolution, but they're limited in terms of scope, in terms of spatial area or coverage. So what's, how I can decrease my resolution, sorry, increase my resolution in seismic? No, another thing. What's the best thing? How someone can help geophysical technique? to constrain them, uh, when I say constrain, to decrease the number of possibility, make the model closer to the real earth. Yes? Yeah, that's one of the things as well. If you have a well, we'll have better resolution. You need to integrate. You need to integrate geological, geophysical data together. All the data available to you, make an integration. The best people who are very successful, who are the one who can integrate between different disciplines. And believe me, there was a guy, Suleiman Tobi in Oxy, when I was doing my training, uh, and also Fanae project in Oxy, he got promotion three times in one year. And he wasn't working so hard. He wasn't killing himself. He was getting involved in every meeting and every discussion, and he had good friendship with everybody. He comes early morning to my office, sit for uh, half an hour, one hour, discuss with me, chat with me, laugh with me, say me some jokes. <laughs> yes, yeah. 
and ask me about, for example, what are your problems nowadays? What are the difficulties you face? I say, oh, blah, blah, blah. These are the, I, the problems I have in geophysical data. These are the things I'm struggling with. He leaves me. Oh, see you tomorrow. Goodbye. Goes to another one. The same story. Goes to another one. And by the end of the week, there is a general meeting. He conducted so much information. He made correlation. Oh, this guy has such problems. That guy has such problems. That's a petroleum engineer. This is a geophysicist. That's a geologist. That's a, another guy. This is another guy. This is a wall side geologist. That's an exploration geologist. He can correlate things. And you'll find that nobody's talking. Nobody's giving answers. Nobody is giving solution to the problem except him during the meeting. Because he knows how to correlate, integrate between things. Good? So modeling is a stage we try to convert physical meanings to real geological observations. Things that geology can be, uh, are interested in. And how we do it, it's not an easy task. Actually, one of the most complex tasks in geophysical analysis, or geoph the steps you have seen, is modeling. And that's the reason geophysicists, they have to take multiple courses, or courses from different disciplines. And that's something frightening the, st the students. <laughs> the students say, they, oh, we take math, we take computer, we take uh, um, physics, so many different courses. Why? Because most of the modeling cannot be done by hand. They can't be done by hand. What, what can aid us? What can help us? Computers, yes. Programs. And that's the reason I ask you to use some ready-made programs. I will not ask you to program things yourself. What's the gravity law? Gravity law is G M1 M2 over R squared. That's the graph, law of gravity, Newton's law of gravity. I might ask you, model it in computer. You can do this modeling simply in Excel. But for complex earth, if you have two bodies, you can do this model in Excel. Bring, make this equation. You can model it. That's a ge geophysical modeling of the earth. However, for co complex earth, for highly uh, changing structures, it's not an easy. Computer will help you, will give you a guide. Modeling is usually a guess. You guess something and try to predict, is it close to the reality or not? And the best way, the easiest way to make modeling is how you go to the field, you go to the field, record data, get a signal, get a response, whatever response is it. Is it a graffiti response, magnetic response, or whatever response is it, electrical response, resistivity of the earth, for simple uh, demonstration, that's a graffiti. Milligal is a graffiti unit. What's the uh, overall or well-known unit of graffiti? What's the universal uh, pair, meter pair? Second squared. This is another unit. The geophysicists, they use this unit, milligal. Hmm? That's the one used by ge geophysicists. Uh, and I tell, you, I tell you later on why they use this unit. So this, there are two different names for that line, what you see here. One of them is called what? Observed. The other one? Calculated. Which one you think I got from the field? I went to the field, take, took some measurements. I got the observed. I got an observed, a reading. So the reading, uh, how? Have I taken them on scatter points or a line, straight line? Straight line, that's 1D. Sorry, 2D. That's a 2D. One, two, three, four, point, a line, a transect, a profile. One profile, that's a profile. So this is zero milligal, and I see negative, then increase. So what I do, I come back to the office, open my computer. I know how to model graphite equation. And have you heard of Coral Draw? Coral Draw is a program, am I right? Have you heard of uh, Adobe Illustrator? Yes, Inkscape. You can create shapes, am I right? 
with this, even PowerPoint, you are allowed to make shapes. So in such programs, that's one of the tasks you will do later on in, your, uh, in this course. You'll be given such a program. You will be creating shapes. That's a shape at having a certain size, at a certain depth. What you need to assign to it? What's that value? A density value. This is milligal or uh, milligram, megagram per meter cube. That's a density. Kilogram per meter cube, that's a density. So these are the densities. And I simulate the things in computer. I ask computer, what would be the graffiti value if I have a such earth in the subsurface? What would be the value here if this is my model? If I assume that that's the model. And I almost carry out the same survey with the same configuration. If in reality I have taken one, two, three, five, these are, it's not continuous reading, it's sampled reading. So you take, in the real field, you take one measurement at that distance. You move another distance, another distance, another distance. And I can connect them with a line. You can connect the measurements with a line. So in computer, you, as, you also use the same configuration, it's the same setup as, you, as the one you used in real life, in your field acquisition. So if, for example, if I assume that this is if this is, for example, my model, that this has 1, 2 point, or 1.2, 1. this is 3.5. Let's say this is, this is the thing I observed. That's the thing I observed. Oh, sorry, this is the thing calculated from here. Whereas this is the thing I observed. This is observed, whereas this is calculated. That's the calculated. Calculated is coming from where? From my model. My model has only a sphere, daira. The density, the body, this, for this body, inside is 2.2, whereas the whole stroke, the surrounding has a density of 3.5. So what do you think about your model? Is it accepted model or not? What do you think? Is it accepted? No, it's not an accepted model. When I can accept my model, at what stage I can say the model is accepted model? Huh? Do you what? Team lithology? Huh? Sorry? Identical graph. What? These two should match. These two should be overlined. Ashen Kida, for that reason, you see they are on top of each other. In this model, observed and calculated are. So you went to the field, you acquired data, and they give you a response. They give you a response. You got the point? You need to model it. In computer, you need, oh, computer, I think the earth is made as such. It's made of one layer, and the layer, each layer has these densities. Give me, the, give me what do you think, based on my knowledge of uh, e, uh, the gravity field, how I calculate the graph. Give me the results. If the, re if the results from the computer, if the calculation calculated field is equal to the observed field, it means your model, is it acceptable or not? It's acceptable. That's how I can, one of the way of judgment about the model, the correctness of the model, the validation process of the model, how I can be certain that somehow my model I created is valid, is close to the reality. And someone might ask, oh, this is complex. Simulation is not done in only geophysics. In every subject, in every discipline, there is simulation. 
aerodynamic, uh, sending even rockets to the, to the space. They just don't just create the rocket, oh, let's send it to the space. They make first a simulation, computer simulation. Even they build a car first, they do what? Simulation. It's almost we are doing a simulation. We give a geologic a model, geological model of to the earth and ask the earth, the, the computer, what response I get. If my response, the response I get from computer is similar to the one I observed in reality when I did a geophysical survey, geophysical acquisition, it means my model is somehow acceptable. Not always acceptable, acceptable. somehow acceptable. If there is, if there is, there could be something wrong in your calculation. And it ممكن أنت إذا ما عارف الجيوفيزيك صح إذا ما عارف الفيزيك ممكن تغلط في السيميوليشن ممكن تغلط في البرمجة. ف don't always have this in mind. If you are want to be a good, be critical. Be critical. Criticize everything. No, what there might could be something wrong. Don't accept everything right away. But that's one criteria. So I can take this as an acceptable model to the Earth because the observed and the calculated values are matching. Another thing we need to keep in mind is that in this case, they are totally matching. There is no variation. What about if that's the observed and this is my calculated. Is it acceptable or not? Acceptable. That's acceptable. It's hard to then make them matching. There is a level of discrepancy between the two. 5%, 10%. I did some kind of modeling where the change or the difference was 20%, 30%. Yes, not always. And even sometimes, if they are matching 100%, they could be not acceptable. They could not be sometimes acceptable. Why is that? Uh, we will know later on. So modeling, uh, that's how modeling is. Modeling has some complications. It's not an easy task. And uh, things we need to appreciate. So here are my reading. These are what? The reading, the observed values of gravity, the one I acquired in the field, whereas the continuous line is what? The calculated. Calculated from, what, from where? From this model. So one way, if I ask you, where is, I'm interested in this uh, target body. I think this has some good ore bodies. That's the target. It's a dike. Then erosion happened. Then another rock deposited. We go back to the geology. That's one of the, one of the rocks. Dike. That's what thing I'm interested on. If we consider that this is a graffiti. If this is a graffiti, do you think that this body has a higher density or lower density than surrounding? A higher or lower? Why? Yes. Uh, the anomaly is a positive anomaly. It's not a negative anomaly. The anomaly, what I see, is a positive anomaly. So this is basically a higher density than the surrounding, the target itself. So these are my rating points. I take one point here, another point here. If someone asks you from the model, where is that exact boundary? Where is the boundary? Where do you think is the boundary? Where is the... Uh, the uh, interface between this target and the surrounding. Is it here? Is it here? Is it here? You don't see this one, usually. If I make this one larger or smaller, it only will slightly modify. You got the point? So modeling is, again, a simplification. It's not the real, the real is. And even in the same rock, for example, this, I assume it's one rock, sandstone, it has one simple density, 2 point or 2.7 gram per cc, gram per centimeter cubed. Is it true sandstone has 
the same density everywhere? No. That's a simplification of the reality. That's the things we need to appreciate. We cannot make things very precise. Or else you keep modeling forever. Computer will go crazy. A computer will say, oh, I can't do these things. Please spare my life. So uh, another thing with modeling is the sensitivity. The sensitivity of the modeling. What I mean by sensitivity, if I ask you, if you are having this, this is your response, field response. Observe data. Can I precisely make the model? Slight modifications in here, these dikes, will not make much difference between the model, between the observed and calculated. Slight modifications will not make much or huge difference. What is their tilt? What is the thicknesses? It's hard. It's totally hard. The modeling is uh, having some complications. So sh size, shape, they are hard to model. You accept your limitations. Unless you have, for example, what? What would, could be a well? A will can help a lot the modeling because you compare your model with the reality. If you have a will, you will constrain your model. Yes? Yeah, that's the reason. At least, at least in one, the will location, you are 100% sure. You have high confidence that your model is good. And you start extrapolating from that point. Probably you have two instead of one. That's better. But you know that gravity, doing a gravity might cost you only two big area gravity. might cost you a few thousands. Whereas if you drill a wheel, it costs you millions sometimes. Millions. Yes? What about this? What about visiting the area? So uh, what other things you can bring to minimize the, the complications, a randomness, or minimize the, um, the max possible scenarios or possible models, possible different models? One of them is having a visit to the field, field exhaustion, having an outgroup. So for Oman, at least the, one of the best Places to do geological analysis. Uh, Natah, have you heard of Natah formation? It's a formation in the subsurface. It's a formation we uh, produce oil from Shuaiba formation. Uh, Natah, at least full section, is well exposed, clearly exposed where? In Salah Ark, in Adam area. It's an outgroup. You test the rock. The same rock is in the subsurface. The same exact rock is there in the subsurface that produce oil from. So knowing its velocity, knowing its thickness, knowing its characteristics, knowing other parameters, interesting geological parameters about Nata, about the reservoir, is easily accessible to the, uh, in, the, in the outgroups. And this brings me back that no one is alone. They, the geologists, petroleum engineers, geophysicists, they complement each other. No one is better than the other. Good? So another thing that's, uh, as I said, sensitivity. Uh, one of the most comp big uh, other complication, it's uh, usually controlled by your uh, budget, by your uh, time you have, is spacing is the spacing between readings. So I have taken 2D measurements, 2D line. Those are my real points, measurement points. And when I do, based on this, I do modeling. I do modeling. So I can, these are the results I get, continuous line, uh, dashed line, sorry. Dashed line. However, the real model, the real Earth model could be the best model is this one. The best model gives you what? The solid line. 
not the, da, the dotted line, the solid line. Are they agreeing based on the based on the data points? Are they agreeing or not? In here, without seeing. Yeah, they are agreeing. In these two points, are they on top of each other or not? Same. 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 Everyone is same. So there is no difference between calculated and observed. There are no difference between the real, the model which produced this one. But what brought this error? What could bring the error is your spacing, what we call sampling interval, spatial sampling, the difference or interval between reading. We call it spatial sampling interval. You don't need to know this detail, but this is like uh, station spacing. This will affect a lot your resolution. You could minimize this error by doubling, reducing the spacing, doubling the number of acquisition points. So what happens if you spent 1,000 based on these, uh, these points, the recorded uh, points, what happens if I want to, to take instead 20,000? If I spent, sorry, I have uh, spent, let's say, 1,000 real for 40 points. If I take 80 points, how much I spend then? Maybe 2,000. Maybe 2,000. So your exponential will increase. And believe me, when uh, just recently before the start of the semester, I was having a field work in, in uh, Dokum area, some place there in Dokum, and I was carrying out a graffiti survey alone. In one day, the area was so big. It was really big. And I was, there were some, uh, some people who were helping students. Actually, they were students. But they were totally dependent on me. <laughs> they don't know how to, and we have only one uh, equipment. And we have only half day, not full day. We have to return back to Masqab the same day, from Dokum to Masqab. So how I, can re how, how I can decide what's the spacing? It's difficult. What constrains the spacing then is your uh, availability time, the time you have your budgets, for example, the other external limitations, there comes external limitations. These are all simple things in modeling. These are yet very simple things, uh, understood things. Uh, things are yani, manageable somehow. You can manage them. You can go through them. But there is one complication which is really tough. What we call this? Complication, non-uniqueness. Non-unique. Unique is something very special, something very different than the others. Non-unique means the opposite. So geophysical have this inherent, this is a, something inherent in geophysical techniques, especially uh, the potential field methods, potential fields. When I say potential fields, I'm referring to magnetic and graffiti, basically. These two are potential fields. They are passive. Both of these are passive techniques. Seismology, earthquake seismology is also a passive technique, but it's not potential fields. It's not a potential field. Potential fields are usually most often graffiti and magnetic techniques. That's what we call potential fields. They are so much in have this problem. Then in this, this problem is an inherent thing in potential fields. What do, what do I mean by that? Let's take the graffiti by, as, as an example, graffiti. That's the force of graffiti, am I right? That's the force of graffiti. Between two points, between two bodies. So what, what happens if I increase the separation? The force? If I decrease, this will, think I bring them closer, the force will increase. So however, I'm bringing them the closer, this will increase. I want this to be constant. I want F to be constant. I bring them to closer, I decrease R. What I can, what I change, I can make to make this constant. I change the masses. It's the same force. So there, you have two possibilities. There are two things. 
يعني one possibility they were big masses R1 that's R1 or I brought them closer but they decreased the masses R2 these two gives you the same F these two different things gives you the same configuration gives you the same thing am I right? So if we assume, if we do not see which one, if you are trying to, rem you try to determine that there are two bodies, there are two bodies, you don't know their densities, and you don't know their separation. Which one is possible? Which could be the possibility? Which could be the right model? I don't know. I don't know. So this is the same thing. Ignoring the rest. If this is the only thing you have, it will give you the same anomaly. If we assume that this elongated lens like shape have a density, some density greater than the surrounding, this gives you the same anomaly, the same response. This alone brings it deeper, the distance increased, but its thickness, size increased. Am I right? So it gives you the same. Or if you bring it deeper, make it denser, higher dense, it still gives you. If you make it very thin, small, if and increase its density way larger, it gives you the same anomaly. Which one is the, the right model? They're all giving you, and if you go computer, computer, give me one model. I can give you infinite, infinite, endless number of models. Which one is the right one? In such cases, whom is the best person to refer to? Do you think? Geologist. A geologist could be of great help. Your geophysicist then is not uh, of any help in such cases. So geology, you refer back to the geology. Geology, could, what do you think is possible in this area? Which we have got many models. Which is the you think is the best model? What shall I do? The geologist can give you some aid based on his knowledge about the area. Oh, what I see out on the on the surface from the outgroups. Yeah, one might bring a model. One geophysicist might bring a model in the subsurface. He says, one two kilometer by two kilometer. This is all diamond says that this is a diamond mine, pure diamond. Is that possible? The geologist, he says, no, that's not an acceptable model. Impossible to have such. Otherwise, if we have such thing in Oman, dump oil production, go mine for diamond. <laughs> so geologists are of help, great help. There are other techniques to constrain, but Again, based on your conceptual, what do you think? It's a conceptual model. What I think is possible. What the geologist thinks is possible. What is another myth technique to reduce this uncertainty? What could be for the then to reduce this uncertainty or this variation in the number of models or what we call non-uniqueness? What another step could be done? Geophysically. Huh? What do you think? Who can tell? One mark. Yes. Use another method. Use another method. I lied to you, there is no more mark. <laughs> yeah, good. But that's the right answer. What's your name? Amr. Amr. Amr are also smart because you are sitting nearby Khalil. <laughs> so Amr, yeah, he's right. Do another technique. The other technique gives you another model. Do three techniques. And that's very common in geophysics, to, do, to use more than one technique in the same place. Do use more than one technique. Graffiti with seismic, graffiti with another thing. This is very helpful to minimize the uncertainty. That's the best thing usually from geophysical perspective. Still, the aid of geologists is very important. The conceptual model the geologist brings his 
is very necessary. You cannot go without that point. Good? So what is, what is modeling, how it's done, what the steps involved? Modeling is a, an iterative process. It's, yeah, and it's something you keep updating, updating, updating. Or nowadays, computer does, does it. So modeling, how it usually the computer programs, how they work, you have this data. What are these are surface map of some data. Graffiti field, graffiti variation. So these are low graffiti values. These are high graffiti values. Maybe there is a fault. Maybe there is a fault. So the fault bringing the denser material to the top. The low density material went deeper. Maybe there is a fault like that. So what do you do? You model. You create a fault like what you see here in your model. You think that's a fault. You think that's a fault. And in the computer, you gave this to the computer. Computer, I made this model. Can you give me data based on this model? Give me back geophysical data. Computer gives you calculated. These are observed, whereas those ones are calculated. What I do? Comparison. I do comparison. So the basic comparison is our root mean square. Error, difference. يعني نقطة مع نقطة الفرق. هذا هذا النقطة مع هذا النقطة. فرق. Square. هذا ناقص هذا. وهذا ناقص هذا. Mean root mean square is يعني كل نقطة مع نقطة أخذها أسوي square. That's what we call we. That's one of the technique. If this root mean square goes to very small number, ah, that's unacceptable. Yani, is the difference is let's say one percent or five percent, so this is unacceptable. If it's not, it's larger than that value. Is the difference is larger than probably five percent? What do you do? Update your model, change your model, make it a different model. And the process keeps repeating, repeating, repeating. So going from model, going from a model to data is forward modeling. Forward modeling is basically moving from a model to data. Whereas inverse, inversion or inversion, geophysical inversion or inverse modeling is having data and converting the data to model. You might be get confused. You say just you say you say Khalil, you just said that I make the model. Yes. I give the computer initial model. Computer. Computer. I talk and V1 kida kilometer method V2 Arbamid kilometer. I talk. That's what I think. There are two layers. Each layer has a specific uh, velocity. Stop following me. So computer, what it does, it use again some mathematical formulas. It will update it itself. It keep updating your model itself without you getting involved. But you just need to provide some initial model. So how you do inversion is not an easy task. We'll never ask our geophysics students, undergraduate students, to build inversion programs. This is a master degree or PhD degree level. To, do in, to create programs or mathematical formulas in Excel or advanced MATLAB or other programs to do inversions. But the basic idea is the same. I go from data to a model, update my model, keep updating my model, that's what we call inverse modeling. Whereas creating data from a model, that's forward modeling. Which one do you think is, uh, is more important? Huh? Both of them. They are done. They are simultaneously are done during the modeling process. You need both of them. You do the. In terms of calculation, yeah, forward modeling is easy to do. Inverse modeling is more complex to do. So you finished. You finished modeling. You think your modeling is complete. 
the way you present your results is as vital as every other step. The way you give your data is very important. Creating some kind of contours like these without color bars, without numbers, is use useless. Make nice contour, clean contour. Contouring have been taught you in geology one, I believe. So computers can do also contours. Isometric projection, use different kinds of visualization techniques. So I remember some students in their final year project, they bring me a map, a map of seismic, any map. This, it has different colors. I only see almost like two colors or one color. Why? Because you, they were using a color scale. They make it large from zero to 20,000 meter per second, velocity. Yani. But in reality, the variation in rocks is only from 1,000 to 4,000. The variation in this velocity in these rocks is within this range. Why you make it large scale? I should, this, the limits, the limits from my data, this should be 1,000, this should be 4,000 or a little bit higher. You almost can't see anything. So visualization is very important. And whenever you visualize the thing, if, it, if you can do it in simple way, the best simple way is contouring. But sometimes uh, 3D, 3D plotting is very good. That's kind of 3D plotting. Making a model in 3D is very important. So finally, I think I presented my data in a good way. Then comes the help of whom you think? Geologists. So that's the reason in PDU, for example, as I stated last time, they prefer the geologists to act as interpreters. Whereas in OXY, they prefer geophysicists to act as interpreters. Everyone, the, what is the best way? What's best? Whom you think is the uh, following a better technique? Geologist. Both of them, yes. It's, bit, it's always good to bring them together. Let them work together. One Jew, physicist, one Jew. Geologist, geologists know how faults are formed, what are the possible structures, how anticlines. Methylen, in a rifting, whenever there is a new sea belt in rifting areas. Could you tell me an area right now on the earth where rifting is taking place? Mid-oceanic ridge. Huh? Mid ridge. Uh, it's mid-oceanic ridge, but where is the, that's a rifting place, but where those happens? In Atlantic, mid Atlantic Ocean, Indian Ocean, but a recent new one, it's still not a ocean. Still, the place is not an ocean. Huh? In, Africa. in Africa, yes. That's in Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, there is a rifting. After millions and millions of years, the, a new sea will build there. Red Sea is rifting. The Red Sea is opening. It's a sea. After uh, some millions of years, it will become an ocean. Oman getting closer to where? Yeah. Iran. So one day, you, go, you might be driving by car or walking to Iran. Not you, your grand, 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 grand children. Not necessarily you. So uh, my point is that if there is a rifting, a rifting sitting, a tectonic rifting, what I expect, a, a reverse fault? No. What, should, what kind of faults in the rifting places? Normal fault, extensional faults. Normal faults. So you, from the data, you can tell, oh, this is a rifting stage. In the rifting, I have normal faults. Whereas geophysicist, he's not aware of tectonic structures and other things. He might interpret it poorly. Whereas the geophysics can associate or recognize the pitfalls, the errors in geophysical data. He says, no, this thing is an error in the processing. Ignore it. 
He says, oh, this thing could be an error during the processing stage. Ignore it. Whereas the geologist, even there is an error, he, 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 this is a gold. <laughs> this could be a gold. First time I'm seeing such big gold. I remember there is a, a company was doing interpretation, you know, Oman data from Oman. They found a very interesting feature in the seismic data, and they never know what exactly it is. And they brought the idea to the geologist. Geologist, do you know what they said? That is an old imp creator impact. Which creator impact? Nizak. Nizak dhakham darb ard. Nizak dhakham darb ard. The geophysicists didn't even know. They brought the idea to what could be this feature? They said, oh, this could be an, a creator impact, an all. And it, other rocks then deposited on the top of it. So this is, uh, what do you think, which one, which data is geological data, and which is a, a real geological cross, not a real, or a model, a geological cross section? Is this, A is a geology, or B is the geology? A is the geology. This is the seismic data. Do you think this appears in seismic data, these colors? Huh? Who made this coloring? Geologists or geophysicists? The interpreters who were interpreting the data. Who made these red lines? The geologists or geophysicists. What do you think are they? False. Good. So you are already just to graduate from the course. <laughs> okay. So you are good in interpretation, interpretations. So what you see, this is behind, that's a seismic. The color I'm using, the color scale I'm using, they call it gray scale. There are many different colors. I can use different color scale. This color scale is good for the, for example, this gray is very old color scale, standard in, uh, in seismic, displaying seismic data. It's good to display or identify faults. There are other color scales. So this takes me back to the previous, Slide, visualization, how you visualize your data. What color scale you use. So this is what we call a gray color scale. And we call it also variable, uh, variable density area, or variable area density, variable density display. There are other displays. We'll know them later when we talk about seismic techniques. So these are, what do you think are these? Who can tell me what are they without seeing here? Even my hand. You can't see it. What do you think is that? Salt, yes, that's salt. That's salt, they appear. Salt. Salt, they are usually in seismic, they are hard to image. So they are mobile. And they it harku bshula. Shapes like what you see here. They pierce through the rock. For example, in Oman, there is a place we call it Qarat Kibrit. What you can do there? In the old days, many Omanis, they went there to get salt. Qarat Kibrit. And most of Oman, all well actually, were originated from the, salt, from the salt, movement of salt. For example, if, I, if you think of a candidate place to drill, based on this data, only candidate, يعني مكان أتوقع ممكن يكون في أول وين أفضل مكان؟ أبوف وير؟ أبوف ذا سولت ليش السولت يتحرك؟ فيسبب لي يعطيني إيش؟ أنتي كلاين الأنتي كلاين مكان ممكن يتجمع فيه الأول there could be accumulation of oil there so the best place then to if you don't have anything and other data, and you are asked to drill based on this, this section drill where you think is uh, the, these places. That's where you drill. Yes, could be false, but those faults are associated even with the salts. The salts are creating these faults. This is an extensional, fe extensional feature. So these rocks were deposited before pre -rift, before rifting, before the rocks opens. And some, some, this part, these sediments from here to here, they deposited during the rifting. The rifting stopped. There were no extensional features. 
uh, these rocks were deposited after rifting. If I ask you, what do you think is this area? What, what, sed what rock or sediment are there? Huh? Ish? Yeah. Is this cap rock? This, this is big, so big, Yani. What is, is there a scale here? You see, this is from here to here, how much? Two kilometer. هذا من هنا لين هنا نص كيلو نص كيلو كابروك لا صعب ها ذيس روك ذيس هير ذيس إس سي كولوم ذيس إس ووتر هذا البحر so this is this data from a marine data they were acquired in marine so that's the reason I, see, I don't see reflection. I don't see reflection. Those are reflections. Yani the stronger this black, it means the stronger the reflection. The stronger the difference between velocity of two rocks. And that's the reason I see good, strong reflections here. Why is that? That's what? Sea bed. Sea bed. The velocity is, of course, between the water and the rock. فيعطيني ريفليكشن قوي اول شيء. That's it's a basin analysis probably. If you want to go in detail about basin analysis courses, you know understand more. And seismic data are must. So uh, one minute or five minutes uh, are remaining to the end of the lecture. Any questions? Any questions so far? Uh, the, the, rec the lecture is recorded or uploaded. And uh, I ask you to bring back the attendance sheet. And anyone haven't uh, marked it yet? Yes, please, it's with me. So you are free to leave. Uh, I added you, please log in to Moodle if you have questions related to the course. Any general questions, please ask me. Next week, we'll have a lab. We'll start lab here. The first few weeks, probably will not use uh, computers, from, but uh, from probably week four or week five, we'll start using computers. During the time when I ask you to bring you computer or laptop, in case if you don't have a laptop, please share with your college. Please share or work together with your college. You are free to leave. Thank you very much. <laughs>